is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering One Piece, episodes 240 and 241. In these episodes, the townspeople are quite determined to chase our guys down, and Usopp, even though he does not think he is part of the Straw Hats anymore, is still very much perceived as being one of them, and they are coming after his ass, which I really didn't think about, but it makes sense. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Florian for commissioning this episode. What's up, Florian? Um, so, yeah, these episodes are very interesting to me because I don't know what I thought the vibe was going to be when we caught up to Robin, but it certainly isn't this. The thing that I was expecting was Robin has been unwillingly dragged back in uh, to, to, to her criminal life after managing to, she thought, successfully escape. And that when she ran into them, there would be either a sense of shame or a sense of, uh, you know, I, I have to pay this debt that I owe and I'm sorry, or anything to sort of indicate that this isn't really what she wants. But the vibe that I got was a lot more like, look, y'all are great and everything, but it's just not me traveling with y'all. And I'm going to go back to like my criming because that's me. That's really the thing. And, oh, Florian is saying the crew, the crew paid for them. I'm so sorry. I gave Florian credit. Thank you to the crew for commissioning this episode. You're right. I forgot. We were at, we are in that block of episodes right now. Thank you to the Straw Hat crew. Appreciate you. Um, the One Piece slash Straw Hat crew. Um, but yeah, I mean, what might be going on with her is possibly that she's sort of feeling fatalistic right now and she's just decided to lean into her criminess because she doesn't see an escape and she's kind of like, I may as well just fucking admit who I am and lean into it instead of trying to pretend that I can change, which I mean, we've all been there in different aspects of our lives, but there usually there's a sort of tone and... Uh, there's a fatalism in the words that indicates a lack of belief in yourself. It's just like, look, I tried to change. It didn't work. This is just who I am. She doesn't say that. It doesn't feel that way to me. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, of course, but I just really was surprised at the way that went. And I was also surprised at the outrage that Sanji and Chopper both display because it is one thing to have that reaction to Usopp leaving, but having that reaction to Robin leaving when you do not know her, let's be perfectly real about this at all feels just kind of like, all right, guys, get a hold of yourselves. Um, so, all right, let's start with 240. And of course we have her watching all of these shenanigans from afar and Luffy trying to like decide what to do next. He comes out and he is talking to Nami about his conversation with Iceberg and says he saw Robin and is like, yeah, it was her. And when Nami asks, why would she do something like that? Luffy's response is, I refuse to believe it, which, um, I guess does make sense. I mean, Luffy is just, he has a lot of belief in his friends in a way that uh, isn't always warranted. And, uh, but part of me was sort of like, I really need you to believe it though, man. I need you to at least get on board with like the facts, because if you can't do that, we're not going to be able to make any forward progress. 
Um, so then we have the C train arriving and I could not help but laugh because, uh, we have all of these people waiting to get on so that they can evacuate. And there's somebody making an announcement saying wearing a mask is prohibited today when you get on board the C train. And just, you know, considering everything that I had, that we have been through with masks in the past few years, hearing that they are just not allowed is a vibe that I am not used to having anymore. I do not hear that. So it was just a really funny moment of like, it's wait, no masks. And then I realized, oh, they mean like the porcelain decorative masks. Um, and there's a woman who has to be like, hey, uh, this is my face. Look, and she she like pulls on her cheek because the guy is accusing her of wearing a mask, which hateful, truly, sir. And I hope that you wake up just as you're about to fall asleep every night and remember the moment where you accuse somebody of wearing a mask. Um, so Kokoro is getting off of the train here as well with her two, are they grandchildren? Um, Cause there's two of them, right? Or is it just, well, it's just the granddaughter and the rabbit, I guess the rabbit just seems so human. It keeps throwing me off. There's a feeling of almost like that's a kid in a rabbit mask, you know? And she gets the news about the attempted assassination of Iceberg and the paper, you know, showing the faces of the pirates who supposedly committed the crime and is just like, huh, really? Um, oh, Florian says cat, not a rabbit. Of course it's a, it's a fucking rabbit. Look, I know, I know it's not, but like, look, everybody. Don't gaslight me. We all know what's happening here and I won't stand for it. Okay. So when we hop back to Nami and Luffy, he has just fucking leapt off the building and manages to like grab something to swing from at the last second. But I really appreciated when they came to a stop eventually and he's like, "Ooh, that really tired me out. And she just like starts to hit him and be like, what the fuck? dude i thought i was gonna die i just do really enjoy her rising up behind him like slowly with her bangs covering her eyes there's just something about that sort of effect that i always think is very funny um he's trying to be like well i didn't want them to chase us and she's like yeah you didn't have to do it that way you aren't the square nose guy who can just fly okay so uh and they had been like they they wind up sort of hunkering down, but then Zoro ends up bringing attention to them. At this time, though, Nami is looking around and r realizing that, like, the weather is indicating that some big shit is about to go down. And I had forgotten. I always forget, to be honest, that she has this, like, ability to sort of sense what's happening weather-wise. And... I feel like it's a really me doing her a disservice. You know, I really need to be more mindful of the fact that she brings this to the table. The navigator thing, I, I believe that when I think of what it means to be a navigator, I just have a really simplistic view of what that means. And all I think of is de deciphering maps, you know, like figuring out which direction to go in how to use the log pose, that kind of thing. And she has more skills than just reading a map. And uh, it has come in handy a couple of times. So I really just do need to sort of remember that. And it had also not occurred to me that like, she didn't hear about the, the evacuations. So they're working with this information purely on her personal know-how and they're very lucky to have her because it turns out, jumping ahead a little bit, even though Usopp is warned about the storm that's potentially coming, he is still planning to chill on the going merry and not come on to land or do, you know, <sighs> Usopp, bruh, even if it is just like a kind of bad storm, 
you should go to a building even if you aren't going to to evacuate to high ground in a more dramatic fashion coming off of the ship would be a smart idea and i totally understand that he doesn't want to abandon the going merry at this time because of what has just happened and i i do sympathize with that and i recognize that as far as his mentality goes that is a valid reason to stay I just really want him to stop and think about the fact that he heard people outside yelling about this storm because they were that agitated. And maybe that means that this isn't your average little squall, you know? And if he did, just like, he goes to this this guy to buy supplies to help repair it later. And y'all, this man isn't explaining what the deal is exactly with the the evacuation he's talking about how he's closing up and Usopp should like you know get out of here too but he doesn't get specific about the danger the storm poses the kinds of flooding that happen and uh the only thing i can hope for is like you know flooding is going to obviously cover the buildings and stuff that are locked in place Maybe if Usopp is on a ship that rises with the waters, he will wind up being fine in the end. But my mental image of the way this works is much more hurricane-like and that being on the ship is going to prove to be a nasty proposition. So I guess we'll have to see what happens there. Um, so, yeah, the moment where she is like starting to figure this out and says that this is called the city of water. And I feel like maybe flooding might be something we need to worry about. I love Luffy just being like, so what about it? And she's like, well, I guess I'm just like going to check in on it later. Cause it kind of bothers me, but let's go back to the inn. And then we jump to this bar and Frankie comes in. And I really do sort of enjoy the contrast between the reaction that all of the bar patrons have to Frankie walking in versus the reaction the bar owner has. He is completely unimpressed. His eyebrows don't even really go up. There is no reaction from this man. The other people are slack jawed. One person is like, accidentally pouring their booze all over the table because they had their glass lifted to their lips and paused in, in mid mid sip. And this bartender is just like, Oh, Hey man, what's up? Nothing does not care. And Frankie comes in and says, how's your day going? Is it super? And does this dance with his backup ladies that I can only describe as delightful this is wonderful i love it it's so weird and dumb there is something about frankie's vibe in this entire sequence that makes me kind of go oh i wish we could just be friends with this dude he's like obviously a bully and a creep I don't endorse him fully, but he doesn't really seem to like want to ruin people's days, you know, like there are people who do their shitty things because they just enjoy doing shitty things. And then there are people who do shitty things because they just kind of seem like bored and I'm just going to do what I want. And if it like turns out to be shitty because of the effect it has on you, I'm sorry for it, but I don't really care enough to change my behavior. I am just going to keep doing me. And I get that from him a lot more than like, I enjoy dominating the people around me or I enjoy like, uh, he doesn't really seem to leverage his power in a way that is like just an ego thing. Exactly. The only part about him that feels like it's really steeped in ego is that they destroyed his like headquarters, which he does not care for. 
And also that he is strutting around still in this Speedo and Hawaiian shirt, which is its own whole thing. And uh, y'all, later on, he is walking down the street and his ladies are like walking sideways. And I thought that this was just going to turn out to be like just a weird affectation of these characters because, you know, One Piece, sometimes people just do shit that's sort of strange And it's low-key never addressed or there's no explanation given. So I'm watching them do this weird sideways walk and genuinely like, well, I don't know. I guess that's a thing. And finally, he asks them about it and they say that they can't walk front ways because the air catches their hair because it's like two big square sails of hair and blows them away. And that was just hysterical to me. I could not like... That's, that was like almost on par for me with uh, what's his name who led the Pussycat Pirates and his like lifting his glasses with the heel of his hand and me being like, why does he lift his glasses like this? And then you eventually get the reveal that it's like the long claws at the end of his fingers. He has to do it that way. And very satisfying moments. So <laughs> these ladies explaining that that's what's going on as somebody who has big hair as well not big in the way theirs is but still i really kind of did appreciate that honestly um so yeah super comes in or super comes in uh frankie comes in and he is like hey man so i need cola and i love this the dude says do you have money and he's like just refill them i can't believe you want to run your bar with this like attitude of charging your customers money but then his ladies pop up and are like hey man we do have money though after that shopping spree we still have a million berries left and he's straight up like embarrassed he had thought that they spent it all And felt like that was the really cool thing to do. And the fact that they have any left is something that he's like ashamed of. So what does he do? He takes all the money and just throws it in the air and says, everybody here, drink as much as you want. It's on me. Genuinely, literally, they just throws the money away. And this there is a man and it's apparently in the subtitles too but there is a guy in the background who says something like the face of the water seven underworld and that is one of the most unnatural lines i have ever heard in a like crowd dialogue scene that's one of my favorite things is if you've got a scene where a lot of people are speaking at once, if you can separate out what some folks are saying, sometimes you find some real gold in there, some really like questionable lines. A lot of the time they feel like they're improv and you'll just be like, wait, did he really say that? And yeah, this like the face of the, the underworld, just no, no, nobody is saying that. Get out of here. Um, But yeah, he like, again, this is another moment of me just being like, look, he's just like, oh, I have more money. I'm just going to give it to everybody. How can I be mad at that? Just like I can't. And it turns out that he uses the soda to power himself back up to full strength. This is so fascinating. What? An interesting choice. It didn't really occur to me to ask what fuel he runs on. But, I mean, why not? Why not soda? You know, if you're going to pick something that's like kind of calorie dense in its way, but also made of something so simple that it would be like really easy to break down into fuel. Soda makes sense in a weird way. This is one of those that I always like. I have a lot of vices in terms of food and I have like the things that tempt me on a very reliable basis. I'm always a sucker for salt. I don't get into sweets as much, but if you put something cheesy in front of me or something that's got like butter and carbs, garlic, I I will have a problem stopping eating it. 
But soda has never, ever been something that tempts me in a real way. I drink diet soda. I drink Coke Zero. And that's kind of it. And like occasionally I may have something else like mixed if I'm having a cocktail or something. Just doesn't really like pay off to me. The What you put what you have to deal with if you drink soda has never felt worth it to me. It always makes me feel shitty. But like <laughs> Owen runs on soda and he's trying to sort of like get that under control because he's at an age now. He just turned 32 where that's just starting to catch up. Right around age 30 is when your body starts to make it known that the shit you've been doing is a problem. And it has been, but you've been able to get away with it. And that's around the age where it starts to be like, okay, hey, uh, guy, yeah, you can't do this anymore. But yeah, Owen, will he doesn't drink coffee. So he gets up and he has soda first thing. And that's the way he like gets his caffeine and wakes up. And he will go through an entire two liter in one day. And it's just like a completely mind boggling thing for me because we just didn't really have soda in the house that much when I was growing up. When we did, it was only diet. It was just never really a thing. And to be with somebody for whom this is such a vice, it's just fascinating because it's so different from anything. You know, the the other two men that I was in long term relationships with and lived with, they theirs were coffee. They both were hard on coffee, which is such a common one, especially at my age, that meeting somebody who not only does not drink coffee, but seems to like go for soda this hard totally different vibe and uh yeah so the fact that he uses this soda here i was like i'm sorry gus is saying it's worded a bit weird but the frankie family are meant to be kind of like a mafia family so that's probably what he meant by the fa no i know what he meant gus i know what he meant but nobody would say that at a bar because he bought you drinks. That's what I'm saying. It's just a really unnatural thing to say. The, oh, it's the face of the, you know, no, no. They, they'd just be like, oh, hey, thanks, man. Maybe the Frankie family is cool, actually. Something like that. But just being like that, the face of, of the Water 7 Underground is the kind of thing a journalist would use as a headline. Something like that. Um. But anyway, so yeah, the fact that he powers up with soda, I just find really kind of like perfect in a way. And uh, Kokoro knows him and is just like, yeah, so looks like you're doing well. What's up? And her granddaughter and the rabbit are here asking for more juice. And he's like, yeah, really should not be here. This is a bar. But he finally gives in and is like, okay, fine. And he talks with her a little bit about how he feels like everything should be looking up because I got all this money. But there's a fucking pirate who has like completely ruined my shit and I need to get him down. And I can't like I, he, he just feels sort of inadequate is really what I'm getting off of him right now. Just like, ah, he's ruined my good time. So. He gets the soda, inserts it into his abdomen. We have this weird, like, sort of pulsating thing going on with his body. And the two girls are, like, watching him with their mouths wide and ex excited. Even, like, Kokoro and her granddaughter are watching, kind of, like, thrilled by it. And finally, he's like, what are you even doing here? And she says, oh, well, Aqua Laguna's coming, so we have to you know, find high ground. And this is when he says, oh, well, I hope your house is prepared. My house is gone. So I have nothing to lose anyway. And, you know, um, and he relates to her about the situation with Iceberg and how people are saying the pirates did it. But He's saying it in a way that sounds like he doesn't really believe it. The way that he says people are saying felt to me like he didn't really buy it himself. And Kokoro even says, do you really think that's what happened? And 
I thought it was interesting that she immediately is like, yeah, no, I don't think so. And she mentions the world government as well. And is like, I, they've been after him for a while. I mean, it is not much of a leap to think that they came after him. And when he brings up Corky, she's like, no, no, no. I think that this is CP9. And that's what was whispered to Robin, right? Well, it turns out CP9 is like a alleged shadow organization that is not it, it, a lot of people don't give much credence even to the assertion that it exists. And this is the kind of thing that I'm always sort of fascinated by because you know how this sort of thing works. It's a weird line between like understanding that your government is capable of doing much shadier things than you might like to admit and also assigning a massive conspiracy to your government that is so convoluted and incredibly like contrived that it's giving them more credit than they probably deserve as far as what they are able to orchestrate. And so whenever this sort of thing comes up in a story, I always have a sort of weird knee jerk reaction to it because it feels almost like I don't want to give anybody like the, the credence of entertaining a conspiracy theory, even in fiction anymore, because I am so sick of conspiracy theories in real life. And so like, you know, this whole thing turning out to just be like, oh, well, CP9 is real, actually, even though he doesn't think it is. And she is wiser than him because she knows it's real. And he just thinks that it's rumors and hearsay and has no substance. And it turns out that she's like wiser than him because she sees through the lies and knows it's real. I'm always just like, oh man, this is how these people see themselves. Folks out here in the real world who believe these bullshit conspiracy theories genuinely are like, someday you'll see, you'll all see it's real. And I was the only one who could understand and could, you know, see through the, the mainstream media narrative, whatever the fucking thing is that they decide to say about it. So I, lately I've just, any time that one of these storylines comes up with like a secret organization thing, I'm always just like, Oh boy, I know it's real. And I know that like in this world, it's its own thing very specifically, but it's just what always gets me in real life. What it comes down to is people thinking that this giant shadow organization filled with wildly wealthy, powerful people secretly runs the world. But we know that all of the radically wealthy, powerful people who actually run the world are real. Like, why do you need to make up a conspiracy that there's this shadow thing happening when these folks are doing it right in front of you in full view? They don't have to hide anything because they can just do what they want. The ultimate power move is to not hide because who's going to check them? You know, so it, I always just find it very amusing to just be like, oh, well, they have a whole secret thing. Going. They don't need to be secret, man. They own everything. They don't need to be secret. And Epstein didn't kill himself. Anyway, so this whole thing is uh, punctuated by Frankie just being like, it really feels like you know something the way that you're talking about this. But she's just sort of smirking to herself and saying, like, I don't have anything. I just it's just rumors and I'm just guessing. But I don't know. There's a sense for me of like she does know something and she's just kind of fucking with him here. Um, 
she ends it with it always just being rumor is the scary part. They eliminate people without anyone noticing. If you mess with them, you're dead meat. And he looks like a little bit shook at this conversation. So then we go to the moment with uh, Robin and she is meeting with this guy who is in deep shadow and he has like muscle with him, I guess. But he is telling her, good job. You uh, managed to carry out this mission perfectly, which I thought was interesting because she did not actually kill him. And everybody has been sort of treating what happened as a failed assassination attempt. But this man is acting like failing was the objective in the first place, which I'm really curious what the point is of like kind of getting everybody's what's the word I want? You're sort of like letting the enemy gear up and protect itself. If they know now that somebody's coming at you, they're going to increase security and, and, just be more on the lookout and why would you want that you know and there has to be some reason that they would do it this way but it it surprised me that it's not like oh yeah i i was supposed to kill him and i didn't manage it it is apparently the her orders were to not kill him um and then he we cut from there to the announcement about like everybody getting to these areas for the evacuation, a lot more of folks packing up, barring their windows and, and putting these like metal covers so that the flood can't get in families like uh, kind of rushing at this point and starting to really feel the pressure of the time. And this guy says, hold on, I have to fill the gap. And uh, if the inside of our house gets flooded, everything will be ruined. And I was fascinated that the way they are doing this in this universe, because again, the physics of One Piece are, are cartoon physics, you know, it's like Looney Tunes physics most of the time. So I'm totally willing to believe that you just put a metal door over your door and it just keeps the water out and that's all you need to do. But they added the detail that he has to hammer hemp rope into the gap to really make it like watertight. And it just really surprised me that they went that extra mile. And I was sort of wondering if this is like a precaution that is actually taken places. I have never heard of this method, but it makes a lot of sense to me, you know, especially because hemp is really dense and can absorb a lot. So it would expand in that crack and probably make a pretty good seal just fa sort of fascinating to me um but yeah everybody is is working together and we wind up seeing all of them like in one big it, it just reminded me very unpleasantly of the astrodome do you guys remember that whole thing was it hurricane katrina where that happened um for those who don't know what i'm talking about hurricane katrina which i think hit in like what 2000 five i feel like it was like maybe a little later than that but the hurricane hit and people needed a place to go and the astrodome which was this giant like coliseum kind of thing was presented as an option for shelter but fema the uh federal emergency medical something association i don't remember they were supposed to kind of like have supplies ready to handle assisting this number of people and they really dropped the ball it was quite bad and the astrodome wound up being a sort of hellscape for it was weeks that people wound up having to stay there because Katrina devastated the area in a way that is rarely seen. It was kind of a historically bad hurricane. And uh, so people, there was nowhere to go. No place had plumbing, including the Astrodome. So 
there was like people having fist fights about just square footage on the floor to lay down and sleep. The bathrooms were not functioning and just like filled with feces and, and completely overflowing. There was no food. So some folks who had like, uh, looted the snack bars and things like that were kind of basically like gouging folks uh in order to sell like these little packets of chips and bullshit like that and it was really the whole reason that it was such a scandal was because it was preventable the situation did not need to be the way it was and it is it has sort of just gone down as like evidence of how poorly we work together in an emergency kind of lending credence to the idea that if like you know our support systems in this country went down it would be absolute anarchy and it would be bad but anyway things appear a lot friendlier and a lot more organized in this community because this is something that happens repeatedly and in like they are able to tell ahead of time so they provide a place to go for everyone and organize it a lot better this whole thing is done the way it should be done so as we see all of these people getting ready to move out we have that one group that's looking for Zoro. they just saw him running and they're chasing after him Zoro is sort of peering at them from around a corner, wondering why they're chasing him. And I love the simplicity of it. He literally gets hit in the face with a newspaper and is like, oh, that's what's going on? Well, I guess I can't go back to the inn because that's going to, they're going to be all over that place. And just as he's thinking that, they wind up coming back and are like, oh yeah, that's him. Let's get this guy. And like I said, he uh, winds up running and inadvertently leads them right to Nami and Luffy. The dudes went to the inn, hoping to catch some others. Of course, nobody is there. And then some of them go to the Going Merry and we see Usopp, who is hiding behind like a uh, rock formation away from the ship, luckily for him. And he has his... Uh, what do you call it? Slingshot ready to attack if he needs to. But they just abandon the ship and they sort of interpret how bad of shape the Going Mary is in and the fact that nobody is on it as the crew is not going to be coming back to this ship. They Clearly, it's not usable anymore and they have probably just ditched it which works out because this means they're not going to like camp out here or stay or return and Usopp can continue doing what he needs to do and nobody is going to be checking up on it again um but I wonder like he doesn't have much of a reaction to them talking about how clearly this ship is not gonna go anywhere and I was wondering if he was gonna argue about it a little bit even just with himself you know um, so they, the whole thing with Usopp, I'm going to just sort of jump ahead and deal with that. He goes to get supplies to repair it and he spends all of his money and he, he doesn't have any money to like pay for food even. And this guy kind of like takes pity on him and gives him something to eat. But Usopp is just in such bad shape that even like carrying all of these supplies is too much for him. Is is pitiful. It's real pitiful. And I was just so frustrated because it again, Usopp, it doesn't have to be like this, bud. It doesn't. You're doing this to yourself. And as much as I want to have sympathy for you, it's really hard for me to do that at this point. Because you are bringing all of this on yourself. And I'm I, I'm just having a difficult time over here, buddy. I really am. Um, So... Let's go to Sanji and Chopper. They are wondering if maybe Robin got on the sea train and, you know, booked it to some other area. Chopper at one point thinks that maybe he said something to, like, bother her or upset her at the bookstore. And 
guys, this killed me so much. The idea that little Chopper would blame himself potentially for her going away. Oh, that's so in character to me. That is exactly the kind of thing that it would make sense for him to like try and take on a responsibility that is not his and blame himself potentially. And I was so glad at how immediately Sanji is just like, bruh, that's ridiculous. Of course that didn't happen. And I was just like, thank you. Because I I can't, I can't bear to have Chopper over here thinking that even hypothetically. Um, So Sanji is showing this like, you know, the young picture of Robin to this guy wondering like, have you seen her? And he knows immediately who Nico Robin is, and is like, uh, she's an assassin, man. I wonder what's, uh, you know, it's a good thing that we all know what she looks like. So she can't keep sneaking around, but warns them all again, the Aqua Laguna is about to hit. So y'all have really got limited time to get out of here. So, they're standing there and just lamenting the overall situation with losing Usopp and now Robin. Everybody's split up. They, everybody thinks that they are committed. They have committed uh, an assassination. And then all of a sudden, Chopper catches a scent. And without saying anything to Sanji, he's just like, oh, snap. And he follows the scent. And they come up against the, like an intersection of these canals that they can't cross. And Robin is standing on the other side and she is in like spy girl outfit. She has like a long sleeved black leather trench dress on and thigh high black leather boots It is really almost funny how like Halloween spy girl this outfit looks it's just so over the top you know what I'm saying and like the clothing the women wear in this series in general is very over the top but just the transition you know so abruptly it just was really really funny to me and Sanji sees her And immediately is like, dude, we've been looking for you everywhere. Where have you been? Let's go back and meet up with everybody. And she is, he's like, you're too far over there. Hold on. I'll find a way to cross. And then she says, don't bother. Stay there. I won't return to you and your crew. I am parting ways with you. And he says, what are you saying? And I'm like, I feel like she said it. You're thinking about the newspaper, right? Don't worry. None of us believe it. And being falsely accused of crimes often happens to pirates. Oh, bless him. And she says, I'm really sorry for pinning this on you all. But I did do it. The article is right. I infiltrated and and went in and attempted this assassination. The two of them are watching and just horrified. And she says, I carry a darkness within me that none of you know about. Which I thought was a really interesting way to put it. It could be like literal or figurative or both. It could be a darkness that is, I, there's, there's something about me that is sort of out of my control that I worry is going to come back and bite me or the people I'm with. Or it could just be like, there is a part of my personality that is unchangeable, that always turns on people. And I either can't help doing it or don't really want to change or any number of things. It just because of the universe that we are in and the way that powers work, the concept of her 
actually having a force in her that's outside of her control isn't out of the question entirely. So, you know, it's unclear to me how much of this to take as a metaphor and how much to take literally. And warns someday the darkness will be the end of you. And then we flash back to that dude telling them everybody in the groups that she worked in got annihilated except for her. Uh, you're going to take the fall for the attack and I'm going to bounce up out of here. The situation's only going to get worse. And I was really genuinely at that point, this was when I was shocked, like, oh, she's not even like trying to apologize or she's just because she says sorry, but the, not in an apology kind of way, just more like, look, it's regrettable. But what can you do? And just flat out says, yeah, I'm going to let you all be blamed for the the assassination. I know that's what's going to happen. And I am not only fine with that. It is what I intend and need to happen so that I can get away, which is a very, very intense sort of this this purposefulness was unexpected and both Sanji and Chopper are like Robin let's work this out you know and we can get past it and she says look guys it's just too late for that and even though we spent a short time together I appreciate everything you did for me but from this day on we're never going to set eyes on each other again and then says goodbye and we have the really slow walking away, m punctuated by the camera zeroing in on Sanji and Chopper's faces. And again, this was just a moment that felt really like over the top dramatic, considering that they just do not really know her at all. It's just not the same as what's going on with Usopp. And I want them to be more like upset at the fact that she is willingly letting the blame fall on them. They're just upset that she's leaving the crew and not explaining herself, I'm assuming. But I wanted there to be a little bit more self-preservation built into this, a little bit more resentment at the fact that she's like letting them go down for murder. It's all of this is just I won't stop believing in you and, and we can get past this. But I wanted at least a bit of like, I can't believe you would do that to us. And I'm not getting it at all. And I'm wondering if I'm ever going to or it's just always going to be we're on her side and believe that she's sort of misunderstood. Later on, we have a scene with Zoro and Nami and, and Luffy, but really it's between him and Nami mostly where he's talking about ways to try and handle Robin. And Nami is like, it seems like you're already treating her like an enemy. And he's like, well, I have to be prepared either way because I'm not sure. But she's resentful that he's treating Robin like an enemy when this shit is really bad. She's like framing you for murder, guys. Being prepared to treat her like an enemy isn't a bad move, Nami. You're just so willing to give her the benefit of the doubt. And there's a point where it crosses over from being wholesome and sweet and generous to being fucking dopey and stupid. Get it together, guys. I get it that you want to believe the best in her. But even if you do, you've got to watch out for yourselves before you're going to be able to pursue this with her Make sure you don't wind up in prison and then you can figure things out with her. So it is just uh, uh, one of those moments where it, like I wanted more of them all kind of together being like, wow, that's fucked up. What the fuck? You know, um, 
So I'm trying to make sure because we have this whole thing with Sanji and this guy like helping him out and or not Sanji, sorry, Usopp. And he is like doing some repairs and eating back on the going Mary. And he's thinking to himself like, oh, this guy was really nice and really considerate. I appreciate that so much. As he's looking out over the water, he's starting to notice that things are like beginning to get choppier and it's starting to look a little bit stormier. And I really do enjoy as he's noticing and being like the waves are kind of getting high. The camera zooms in on the going Mary's like figurehead as if it's kind of going, yeah, buddy, it's uh, kind of worrisome, don't you think? There's no dialogue. Its face doesn't change. But there was a, just a sense of the going Mary being like silently screaming from the inside. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so, all right, we have the exit of Frankie from Blue Nose Bar and just says as he's leaving it's time for another rampage <laughs> which I don't know why but just the flat out saying of it it just it's time for another rampage it's not like he's not even really trying to cloak it in anything anymore he's just like well I'm going to go fuck up people's lives. Um, and the bartender is talking to Kokoro and it's like, what do you think got into him? And she says, I don't know how idiots think. Only idiots know how other idiots think. And I was like, well, I mean, I guess that's, she's got a point. She has a point. Um, so, the conversation when they're all deciding what it is that they're going to do, Zoro is saying, we only let her join for a short time, but it'd be embarrassing if we just ran away because we got scared. Isn't it about time that we settled the matter, the matter as to whether this woman is friend or foe? And of course, you know, most of them do not want to hear that she is an enemy and he says the whole, like, her saying it's only going to get worse suggests she's going to actually kill Iceberg. So we're not even going to just be pinned for an assassination attempt. It is going to be a full murder. And this is when Nami starts to be like, look, I, I can't help but think we're looking at the worst possible scenario. And also, we're not taking into account Robin was with somebody. Iceberg said there was a masked man in the room with her, a really big guy. And Sanji saw her with a masked man on the street. And she wants to sort of turn it as whoever this is, is probably making Robin do this. But rightfully, Zoro is like, that could be what's going on, but also it could just be that she knows this guy already. It's not, you know, I get it. Again, you want to believe she isn't willingly doing this stuff, but there is no reason to think that you, it's just because you want to, you would rather think that. And he is determined to track her down, but also admits that the world government has been trying to track her down for decades and they have not succeeded. So obviously it is going to, they have their work cut out for them here. Um, meanwhile, throughout all of this, I'm wondering where is Sanji and it's finally, they ask the question of like where he's at out loud and Chopper doesn't know. He just, straight up apparently did not notice that Sanji didn't come with him. And I was like, bruh, <laughs> look, I get it. You lost track of Nico Robin because she went with somebody after this like little signal, but you losing track of Sanji too. You got to start keeping better awareness of your surroundings anyway. Um, so all through this, Frankie is walking up and down the streets and literally just yelling for the straw hat crew and wanting Luffy to come out and like 
re-challenge him. And everyone else is sort of like, dude, they're probably not here. The storm is coming. I mean, not only are they probably gone, but we should also be gone. And when he had run into his cronies, they mention San or they mention Usopp still being on the ship. And he's like, oh, okay. So now I know what I'm going to do. I am going to go get him and use him as bait to lure them out. So you guys start going through town and letting it be known that I have him. And meanwhile, I am going to go get him so that I can back up my claims. And I was so sad over this, y'all, because I don't want Usopp to have to go through anything more with these guys. And I really hope he finds a way to slip through their fingers because if he gets used as bait to force a fight, it's just him being humiliated all over again. And I really don't want to see that. So I'm just hoping that like that Usopp, you know, the, the one thing that I'm hoping for here. Usopp's skills and special abilities are all about creating, tinkering, inventions, you know? And if he's going to be fighting against somebody who is made of, like, machine parts, that maybe he's got some tricks up his sleeve that would work against this guy in a way that a physical fight wouldn't, so he's actually better matched against him. I just really want Usopp to find a way out of this. I don't want to see him get caught up again. He did find it funny, too, when he's talking about how I'll use him as bait. And all of his guys are like, oh, God, boss has got his his mean face on again, his bad guy face. I just found that kind of funny. Um, So we have then the conversations in the, like, the facility where everybody is sheltering where they're all talking about this pirate crew and it's getting they're fomenting this mob everybody is looking more and more agitated the people talking about the straw hats are ballooning up the numbers that they have they're just trying to say like who knows he at least has 50 men he may have as many as a hundred but considering what his bounty is he may have as many as like three thousand so everybody starts to get on the same page of like oh we have to go and deal with these guys then and make sure that they can't come into this building and threaten our friends and family and they all are outside of this shelter and they all have saws which i guess is just because of like the shipwrights you know and their their yard and all of the tools that they've got but i don't know why i just found it really funny that like that's what everybody chose. There's, I'm sure that there are hammers, that there are other implements, but they all chose saws. And I feel like it's not really a good weapon, but it's fine. Um, and then we get to see the uh, Pier 1 crew. I just realized Pier 1. I didn't really think about that. Oh, boy. Anyway... They are also like seated outside one of the doorways in and uh, Square Nose is like, I don't know if they'll come up here, but if they do, they're fools. And Polly is saying, I mean, they might be fools because I saw like, like I heard about Luffy just getting into it with Frankie in the middle of the day. So maybe they will try something here. And we have then a moment of... um Khalifa and Iceberg talking to one another. She asks him why he has Nico Robbins poster up in his room. And I thought it was interesting because in the subtitle, it says he replies with, are you curious in the dub? He replies with, does it bother you? Which I feel like has a really different tone to it. Are you curious? I mean, that honestly doesn't really even make sense. She asked you. So obviously she's curious or she wouldn't ask. But does it bother you almost implies jealousy in a way. And he just basically is like, I can't tell you. 
but she is a devil. And that is like all we get out of him before we cut to our friends who are like bouncing from rooftop to rooftop in a very parkour like style, trying to avoid all of the townsfolk who are after them. And they are hiding in these shrubs, looking at the building and thinking that they like may have to go in and find Robin. And I'm like, I'm not so sure that she's in there. There's also trying to find Sanji. I don't know what's going on with him, but they see the crowd of men that are like out in the, the front, like sort of yard area. It's like a courtyard and trying to decide how they're going to handle this situation. And as they're deciding this, the camera pans over to a pair of black high heel boots and a flapping like orange and white check cape. And I think that these are going to be Nico Robin and uh, her weird friend with the mask. But we don't get to see their faces. The camera pans up really quick. Their top half is in total darkness and then smash cut to the end. So... Yeah, that's where we leave off here. So I do not know what is going to happen, but we shall see. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to wrap this one up, but thank you guys again uh, for listening, for participating, and to the crew for commissioning this episode. Really appreciate you guys a lot and looking forward to the next one. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. <laughs>